We live in a world where an indie title can look and sound as good as a AAA title, and that's amazing. But it also means that I uh, just subconsciously expect these titles to be as polished as a AAA title, and that can never happen, because it takes money and teams and directors and producers and all sorts of things that an indie game will never have. Polish is tough. Polish is expensive. And indie titles can't do that, and Edge of Eternity is a good example. Calling this unpolished is no insult. It's an alpha release of an indie game. It's unpolished. But this is an excellent opportunity to look at how to polish a game, because Edge of Eternity is gorgeous and it sounds great. There are some sound glitches, so you won't hear much of it, but it sounds great. It's fully voice acted, and the voice actors are doing a great job. So... When we talk about how do you polish a game, there is this tendency for people to talk about polishing the audio or polishing the visuals. And those are fine, but Edge of Eternity has already done that. So we can talk about how to polish things other than that. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how to polish writing. Writing is a, a large topic here um, because there's so many different elements of writing. We could be talking about dialogue, we could be talk talking about editing. Uh, which in RPGs is often part of the writing. We could be talking about how the levels flow and how they're integrated into the story. These are things I'm going to touch on. But basically, the whole point here is I want to show devs uh, that might have a hard time polishing their game what they might want to be thinking about. Because I know that a lot of devs focus on fixing bugs or polishing visuals or whatever the players are complaining about. But if the players are complaining about something, it's usually because they haven't been drawn in by the thing you were trying to draw them in with. Which means that you need to fix the thing you're trying to draw them in with, not the thing they're complaining about. And that's uh, something that is hard to do if you're focusing too much on what the complaints are. So we're going to use Edge of Eternity as an example of how do you focus on your writing? How do you pull your writing back uh, and, and then rearrange it and have it come out to be more powerful? Because I honestly think that Edge of Eternity has a lot of potential. It feels like a AAA title's early days. Um, it feels like if they can refactor it and rework it here and there, they can create a really polished and, uh, and grand result. I, I don't have any sort of expectation one way or the other because indie games are a crapshoot and they could go out of business tomorrow. Um, and I'm not really talking to them specifically. The only thing I have to say to the Edge of Eternity devs themselves is, as you move forward, I hope you also move backwards, because the first hour of your game is the most important, and if it remains this rough, you're going to have a hard time getting players. But I am going to talk about it in detail as if I was the director of Edge of Eternity, as if I was the lead dev, because that is a good way to give it as an example. The examples I give are not going to be directly targeted at the actual devs of Edge of Eternity. They're more to explain to other devs how to focus on your own issues in your own game where you can tighten up your writing and make it really flow. Let's go ahead and take a look. There's my mouse. So they start with a really long cutscene. This is almost always a mistake, these text cutscenes. Um, RPGs are fantastic at explaining things during play. You really don't need text cutscenes. Uh, if you do use them, make them as short as possible. This one's really long. It explains that alien colonizers came, and they came with good tech and new diseases, and then we fought them off, uh, or are fighting them off. And that's a fine setting for a game, but it doesn't need to be explained. We can explain it later as we play. There's no reason to, to care about this at the moment. This also is an interesting thing because it writes over a level. It narrates away a level. And that's really interesting because that level would have been the perfect tutorial level. If they want us to have a fun time learning how the combat works, make us a fully armed soldier or squad of soldiers fighting off all of the various alien threats. We get to press X to launch a nuclear missile instead of press X to swing a sword. And it would also give them a chance to explain these enemies. Here are the corrosion-inflicted monsters, and here are the aliens. Are they on the same side? You can tell us by showing us during the level. You don't need to explain what corrosion is. We can see what's happening to the monsters. Similarly, when the main character's story comes up, it can come up during play. It doesn't have to come up 
in a text cutscene. We can be fighting, and then someone from the back line will run up and say, we've got a, a missive from your sister. It's, she says it's critical, and you open it up, and it's like, yeah, my mom is sick. And then you can actually show the player character dropping all their gear and deserting. And that gives you a great excuse for why the player is now level one with crap gear. Um, it gives you a great reason to go into this next level. And it also sets up the combat system and it also introduces us to the main character and we're also playing. Now my guess is that they didn't, had, when that cutscene was created, they weren't thinking like that and they probably never even thought of that until after the cutscene was over. But that's the sort of thing that happens. That's why going back and re-editing and redoing things is critical. It's always about how can you get the most out of your experience. And a big part of that is learning how to stitch these things together. And that's always changing because it depends on exactly what you've written how. So this is the actual first level where we start in a snowstorm. It's, a, it's an extremely linear level um, and that's fine. This is a dialogue level where they introduce us to the two characters. Uh, now, this level could have been massaged a little bit if our first level was with the main character here doing uh, super-powered kung fu or whatever, but uh, it's still a good idea. You get introduced to the two characters, you can use the dialogue to set up who they are, what their relationship is, what they think about, what they are in the world, that sort of stuff, right? But it needs a little bit more work. The dialogue doesn't flow as naturally as it could. Now, the voice actors save it. All of this stuff is fully voiced, which is amazing, and also means that doing it again later might be very challenging, but... Um, a lot of the lines are a little bit forced because it's it's like there's a, a switch where they're either narrating about the world or doing character development and it just goes click clack click clack click clack rather than flowing and you'll be able to see that pretty quickly I think so here they're just doing narration there's not really enough character development and here uh, she talks about a shortcut so this is a little bit of a flaw here because um I guess it's not a flaw, but they are being vague on purpose. It's like, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and narrate about all this stuff, and then I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, you don't mean, well, okay, fine, instead of telling us. And that's sometimes good and sometimes bad. Uh, that was a bad example. We're going to go ahead and give a good example in a minute. Here we're talking about mom's sickness. But, again, I don't think we need to. I think we could shorten that because the ability of someone to shorten a conversation says a lot more about their character than their ability to extend a conversation. So if, uh, if our main character, oops, sorry, if our main character here says, uh, how, how sick is mom? How much time does she have left? How the sister responds is more important than how much that tells the player because the player already knows how much time the mom has, exactly as much time as the plot requires. But we can establish what sort of person the sister is by how she responds. So instead of having her just flatly say something like, oh, she's getting pretty bad, the pain is getting unbearable, uh, she can just say something like, I don't know how much longer she can stand the pain, or something similar to that. Um, this will allow you to focus the character on something like, rather than uh, mom being sick or dying or something like that, she can focus on how much pain mom is in, or she can say something like, I'm not sure, I haven't seen her in a week. These sorts of things can really help to explain the situation of the world and who these characters are, um, because the player doesn't need to know the actual stuff in the game. The player doesn't need to know how many days or weeks the mom has left, because there's no actual time pressure. They only have to feel like that stuff is important, and in doing that, you can also establish that the players are, uh, the characters uh, have, you know, specific relationships to each other and specific emotions. These are crystals, by the way. It would have been nice to have this be the time when we talk about crystals instead of the opening cutscene. We could just say, oh man, this glows, but it's not warm at all. It's still, I wish these were, I wish these were warm. And then the main character could hear, here could say, warm or cold, the, alien, the aliens want them either way, something like that. That'll set you up with a little bit of characterization while explaining the world. And that's the sort of thing where all your dialogue has to do double or triple duty. All of your dialogue has to both explain things and also establish who these characters are, what they're doing in the world, how they feel about each other. Um, and it can't just be something that you switch between. It has to be embedded in each line. And that's something that, that happens with a lot of re-edits. It's not something that comes 
naturally. It's not something that just flows off your pen. Your first take is not going to have enough subtext. You're going to need to go back and do it again. Um, and that's the sort of feel that I get from this and from nearly every indie game where it's like, writing dialogue is fun, so write more dialogue, more dialogue. This dialogue I like. I like this dialogue a lot. This exchange is fantastic. Um, except for this part where he goes into great detail. That's not necessary and should, should just be cut. Um, the part where they'd say, have you ever seen someone die of corrosion? Yeah, have you? Yeah, well then we can stop talking about it. That's excellent. It establishes so much. It tells us that these two people, while they are brother and sister, they don't really hang out a lot because they don't even know whether the other person has seen someone die horribly. That's something pretty big. You think if they were a close-knit family, that would have come up. And similarly, when she's like, then I don't want to talk about it. You know, we don't have to, we, we finished. That we, we both know what's on going on here. We're, we're done talking. That's great, too, because it tells us exactly who she is. The only problem with it is that the same dialogue happens later on in the opposite direction, where he says, I don't want to talk about it. And that's... I, I don't think having both characters be, I don't want to talk about it, sort of people, it was a good idea. I think that it would have been better to have them have a little variation, but that's a minor complaint. And again, that's just something where you probably didn't realize if you were writing the story, you probably wouldn't have realized that those two pieces of dialogue were going to be so close to each other. And if there had been like an hour between them, then no one would have noticed. And I'm sorry the sound is so low. I've turned it way, way down because of some sound glitches. Um, but the voice acting is really, really good. So is the music. So when I was talking about uh, how I was annoyed that they were being um, vague on purpose, the reason is because both of these characters have been to this level before. So he already knew this level. But here's another thing. These sort of short cutscenes. These are fine, but there's one thing that's missing here, and that is organic camera movement, uh, like that. When you take control away from the player, you have to keep them visually interested, and the easiest way to do that is to have these camera motions sort of pseudo-blocked out so that they move naturally. After 30 videos of Life is Strange, we sort of explained that a little bit in a very primitive video, uh, but basically, you don't want to hold long, flat shots of people who aren't moving. That's not, not very good. Um, and that happens a lot in this level. There are a lot of cutaways where the characters both stop and the camera goes to a stopped angle and it just sits there. Um, the only times when the camera does move, it moves with a very, very mechanical linear pan. It's really um, actually draws me out. It would have actually been better to not move it if you were going to use it, such a mechanical movement. Uh, either way, this is the first level. We could talk about level design a little bit. Let's just touch on it, because levels need as much love as everything else. This is a mine level, and it's a linear level. But here's the thing. If your level is linear, you can arrange it any way you want. And there's no reason why it should just be an endless series of bland caves. This was an opportunity for them to really, really strike us with an amazing visual. So I might have considered something like a giant crystal shaft, um, where you're just going up around a central crystal. That way you always have this really amazing visual with a lot of verticality to it, um, and that would have been fun to look at and to watch, and you get a sense that you're going up or you're going down, um, and that would have probably helped contrast with the earlier level where you couldn't see anything and you were moving in a straight line. Where a level where you could see things and you're moving up in a spiral, that seems like a great idea. Uh, but more than that, I get the feeling from this level that the level dev is just getting started, getting a feel for how these levels should feel. Um, I have a feeling that if the level dev went back and just reworked this level, it would feel a lot better. Obviously, it's a tutorial level, so it's very blandly laid out, and that means that you have to make up for that with the visuals. You have to make up with that, um, for that with something that is striking, and they just didn't do it in this case. So that would be my, my priority if I was going to go back and fix this level. But there's one other important aspect here. As we learned in the opening cutscene, the aliens are all about mining and taking crystals. This is a crystal mine. Moreover, it's a crystal mine that we've been to before in our childhood. This is an excellent opportunity for us to talk in depth about what the aliens are actually doing and how we feel. 
Are there alien things in this mine? If not, why not? When we were here six years ago, were there alien things in this mine? If not, why not? When did the aliens come? And during that conversation, we can also reinforce our characters and what we've lived through and our relationship to each other. That doesn't happen, though. Um, presumably, they weren't really thinking about that. It, it's, it's just a, a mine level. And the mine is interesting. There's some weird stuff going on. But it's not really establishing the whole um, alien or um, corrosion threat. It's just kind of off to the side. And that's not good enough for an opening level. An opening level really needs to cement the core tenets of your fantasy. Um, also, the lighting could use a little bit of work. I, I think they're using some very, very primitive baked lights. Uh, I think that they could do the, a better job baking them. But it doesn't look bad. It just looks like it needs a little bit of work on the lighting. So here they explain once again that this is the place we've been. Uh, this needs a lot of camera work. And this is a fun dialogue in that uh, the... Um, so here, let's stop for a second. This is a great dialogue in that the main character admits that they were a dumb kid and they did dumb kid things. And that is great. And it also establishes that the sister was there for part of it, which is great. It really establishes what's going on. But the dialogue is flabby. This is the sort of dialogue right here, this exact line. This is the sort of dialogue that people complain about when they complain about video game dialogue. There is literally no reason for her to say, ah, I know who you're talking about. She should be instead trying to pull an answer forward or commenting on a state of emotion or something similar. So for example, instead of saying, ah, I know who you're talking about, she could say, oh, I remember that day. Or, oh, yeah, him. Or, oh, yeah, it. Uh, but what they're doing is they're trying to be cagey. They don't want, there's a lot of obfuscation here where they're like, oh, it's, that thing and then they'll reveal that thing later on and that's not very i don't think that that's a very good way to do it um you need to build up uh, expectation in the audience and you do that the easiest way to do that is to tell people what's coming and just by saying that thing oh let's dodge around it that's not really gonna set it up in the audience's mind especially when it damages the um the dialogue to this extent to try and dodge around it like she might say, oh, that damn rock monster or that damn, that damn golem. That would have worked really well, too. It would have established that, she, that A, she's willing to swear. B, she holds something against the golem. Um, that sort of stuff. It, that sort of characterization is what reworking the scene is all about. You go back and you're like, oh, my first take was a little bit weak in these specific areas. Go back and add some characterization. Go back and add some prep for later so that the players will actually feel that that golem is is a risk when it comes because we've talked about it in in you know in these cutscenes. Um, so for example, he goes, really that thing alone killed off half the miners who worked here. This is something that also needs a work. This line is much much to tell rather than show. It, it would have been better if Darian said something like, uh, um, yeah, that golem was surrounded by corpses when I found it, or um, something else that's evocative like. Yeah, I watched it tear through, uh, tear through the miners, or I, I watched it. Yeah, that, that that miner nearly got thrown, you know, through. Uh, I, I, you just come up with something that's evocative, um, and uh, that way you feel that the monster is a threat, and you can establish exactly what kind of physical threat the monster is. Like, oh, that monster incinerated a squad. That's different from, oh, that monster punched a miner through a rock wall. Those are both powerful things to envision, but we have to be told about them in order to envision them, and it would build up a sense of threat, and it would make the earlier boss feel, this first boss, feel interesting. Also, there's a bug in this, cu this cutscene skipping menu, um, where if I hit escape, it goes into the background, and then it bugs out at the end. Uh, so, you know, bugs, little things. So this part is is good. I like how Darian admits that he was a dumb kid. We find out that he had a sense of justice and that he went off half-cocked and that he admits it. That's wonderful. It tells us so much about who he is. Now this line is bad. Um, 
instead of simply stating things like this, I, I think that you need to be pulling the conversation forward. Uh, so I think that it, it's generally better to try and get the other person to admit something uh, rather than just putting in your own line. It's a it's like a, a the 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 inverse of yes anding. You're trying to you're saying yes and and then you're leaving it for them, right? So the idea here is that Celine's comment might have been better off as something like, "Oh, and do you remember who rescued you?" or "Oh, and who did you want to thank for rescuing you?" Something like that, where you can still establish that she's the sort of person who needles her little brother. Um, she's the sort of person who 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 you know pokes fun at him gently. Uh, and that's a really great character trait, but you need to keep the conversation rolling because this feels very mechanical, like click, clack, click, clack. It doesn't really flow. Uh, and part of that is just because it doesn't pull the other participant into a response, aside from, eh, which I believe is what he says. Oh, and that's funny too. Uh, watch this. Boink, 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 boink. <laughs> And this here, this is not a very good line. But if she had pulled him into the conversation properly, it wouldn't have to be there. He would be saying something else like, yeah, yeah, thanks again, or uh, for the hundredth time. Chest. Woohoo! Yeah. Zoom. Let's fight. Rah. So here's a cutscene that's uh, nice. It needs a little bit of work on the animations. These mechanical animations are a little bit distracting. I feel like there is a lot of linear lerping rather than organic lerping or manual um, in-betweens, which does give it a mechanical feel. That mechanical feel would go away a little bit if the camera was more organic, but it's not. So this is the first combat. I think it would be better if this had been... I think it would be better if this had been the thing that we um, did as the opening scene where we were a super soldier. That would have been much more compelling and interesting. The uh, t t Teaching people how to fight by giving them basic level one enemies with basic level one heroes is one of the most boring things imaginable. Now that said, um, uh, the basic idea of fights in RPGs is to be serviceable. There are very few RPGs where the fighting is the main draw of the game in terms of being the most interesting part. Um, usually an RPG focuses on making one thing really interesting and then using boilerplate standards for the rest. And that's clearly what they're doing here. This combat is intended to feel a lot like other kinds of combat, and it's intended to be interesting in that it holds your attention, but it's not supposed to be the compelling part of the game. And I think that's fine, so I don't have any complaints about the combat. Little subtitle error there. So this is a camera opportunity that they missed. You see how they're still focused on the same scene here? Uh, they could move the camera. I know that moving the camera constantly requires more scripting and more animation work, but there are ways to automate it, at least partially. For example, slow, gentle pushes onto the characters that are talking. Um, and that sort of stuff that can all be done automatically and cutting to slightly different camera angles uh, shortly after a line begins is tried and true. You can go ahead and do that fairly automatically. So you don't have to manually script every camera motion, but there is a camera motion coming up that is pretty bad. Now this is also really very, very aggressively narrative. This is all stuff that she should try and pull out of him rather than saying herself. Um, so it might have been better if she'd said uh, something along the lines of, yeah, I, I, uh, I did all the magic and I dealt, you know, I, 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 something about pulling, pulling the other character into making a response because that's what sisters do a lot of the times, right? You don't just lord it over them. I mean, if you do, you're kind of annoying. Uh, but if you are going to be the sort of person that lords it over them, you should lord it over them much more aggressively because you're still doing it for a response. Now this part was, uh, that, that line is fine. I think that line is fine. That was a bad camera choice. 
uh, battle victory screen. No one cares. Oh, I guess maybe the cutscene, uh, maybe the camera I was thinking of is is not or happened already, and I didn't talk about it. There are some scripted camera pens, and they're super mechanical. Uh, so you know, those are the sorts of things that a little bit of polish would go a long way. So here they're explaining the crystals. Uh, I think this is a missed opportunity. Not only are these explanations really long, but all they really say is, I don't know what these are, but they're important. That's kind of something you can say in a much shorter amount of time. Uh, and you could have set it out in the snow when being short and brief about it would have been compelling because they're freezing their butts off. So uh, doing it in here, it feels a little unnatural to talk on and on and on about nothing. And it also feels unnatural to stop short and be very brief about it. So uh, I think that this is the wrong time to talk about them. Now this moves into a conversation about military um, life. And this part I like because uh, this line itself needs to be reworked, but the basic idea here is good. It's just, weren't you instructed in the ways of the crystals? Doesn't really roll off the tongue. Uh, maybe something more like, uh, didn't they teach you how to use crystals in the military? Uh, that sort of thing. And then she says, uh, he says, I didn't mean to sound bitter. This part I like, this sort of back and forth. Um, I think this is all fine. This part especially, uh, this is another thing where he's shutting it down. As I said before, first she shuts down conversation about the effects of the disease, and then he shuts conversation down about the front lines. That's fine. I don't know whether or not it was the best choice to put them within five minutes of each other, but having the player character shut down conversation, having any NPC shut down conversation says more than having them continue the conversation because it means they have a strong emotional uh, thing going on. Now, unfortunately, there is a bug, but it looks like I escaped it, good. I had to re-record this because there is a bug about the menus not working quite right. It's going to ask us to slot something in. I don't really feel like it because that's not what we're talking about. Instead, we're going to come up here. Now, we're supposed to interact here, at which point we... Am I running into the crystal? I am. Okay, so apparently this is a really super aggressive um, setup. So when we click on this, it says something. We used Fire Rift on the energy wall. What the hell is that? No idea. The energy wall looks great, though, and I understand its basic purpose and that we have a key to it, so that's fine. Um, Fire Rift being something that actually exists, that might be something that we want to animate in as a character movement. I don't even know which of these characters have a Fire Rift, the Fire Rift, the skill Fire Rift. Don't know. This is the monster, right? And this is a monster that should have been built up as a memory for um, my childhood, right? Because this is the main character's monster that defeated him when he went off half-cocked. But we didn't build it up enough. Uh, we kind of obscured it rather than talking it up. And that was a bad choice because now I don't really have any connection to it. However, this part of the dialogue is pretty good. This is really uh, good because... I love this. I love this part because he's talking about how he feels in a way that is not just stating how he feels. He's talking about things that haunt him, ways that he responded to things, uh, and of course the troubles he's been in. And he's been on the front line, but it's still this childhood thing that haunts him, and that says a lot. And then they're explaining away the reason why you're going to have an easy time with the boss fight, which I don't think is necessary. So I think that this line is fine, but it could be really, really cut down and punched up to give her much more of a sense of personality. 
Um, but this is this is these are all lines of dialogue that I don't think should be framed this way because uh, it's it's sort of blunt force dialogue and I think it would make more sense if it was more character focused because it's not like these sorts of things are um, unexpected. If we find a boss, we find a boss. That's what we expect to find. We don't need to explain it in great detail. All we need to really explain is how we feel about it. I don't want to skip turn. I want to use fireball. Shboom. Okay, well, apparently if I get punched, fireball doesn't work. Okay, so apparently they'll attack casters. So this is all stuff um, when a... Um, this is all stuff that we kind of expect to learn. And right now what they're trying to teach me is that if an enemy has a chance, they will attack you while you are uh, casting a spell. And that's all fine. This is all, this is all fine tutorial stuff. But... Um, I think that this is a good spot to stop uh, talking about the game because it's been half an hour. I just wanted to make a point that this is the sort of thing that can all be tightened up. And if you're making your own games, take a couple of minutes and really, really think about whether or not you can integrate all of your dialogue because you need all of your stuff to flow. You need your levels to flow well, but that doesn't just mean that the, that the level layout has to be flowy. It means that the level has to be integrated into the story. It has to explain some part of the core theme of your world. It has to allow the characters to express themselves and to establish their relationship to each other and to the world. Similarly, cutscenes don't need to explain things because the player doesn't have to know those things. When the player does have to know those things, you can explain them in the game because that's what RPGs are good at. So that is what I wanted to talk about. And once again, this is not a game that I think is bad. I think that it is an unpolished gem. And I really hope that the devs will smooth up this whole thing, go back and rework it, make it so that everything feels immersive and punches it up. Uh, and a lot of that is just how the dialogue flows and how the level flows and what opportunities get taken. That's it.